Welcome for the third time to this session on deep learning for site channel analysis. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Stepan Pitzek from Radboud University. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Guillermo Perin and Li Chao. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the start of the session after lunch. So I will talk today about deep learning assistant template attack. And like Ileana already said, it's a, it's a joint work with uh, Li Chao Wu and Guilherme Perrin. So what was the big idea of this work? We all know that, well, hopefully we believe that uh, deep learning works well and it can help us make attacks more powerful and break targets more efficiently. But still we had kind of question, okay, but we do not necessarily need to use deep learning only to attack. So we could use deep learning also, let's say, in a feature engineering phase. So to make our selected features more powerful, somehow better, and then use such features to make the attack. And then you could plug in also some kind of simpler technique and still hope for a good performance. Yeah, since there was already a lot of talks, I will skip the basics on side channel analysis. And I will immediately go into profiling side channel analysis. And I will just mention here that attack consists of two phases, profiling phase and the attack phase. In profiling phase, we learn things about the leakage uh, and we build a model, whether it's template or machine learning model, and we use that model to break the target. And one option that is very, very, let's say traditional how to do this attack. And yeah, yesterday uh, there was also a award. Was it yesterday? Two days ago. Two days ago, there was a award for a uh, test of time. So 20 years template attack is successfully breaking targets. But in le let's say in the last couple of years, people moved their attention from template attack and went to more powerful, at least more fancier, deep learning things to do the attacks. And this is the deep learning perspective. And what, what is the point? What's the goal of everything when we are doing is, well, we have measurements, we have traces, and then either we say we take raw traces or we say we take some interval. But in the end, mostly, at least with publicly available targets, there is only a couple of leaking places. And everything else is somehow meant to be disregarded. And of course, with, let's say, template attack, you want to select your features so that you have as good attack as possible. With machine learning, so simpler machine learning attacks like seven years ago, support vector machines, random forest, you kind of also try to do feature selection to make the attack more powerful. And then we went to deep learning and said, yeah, the advantage of deep learning is you do not need to select features. So you leave everything for deep learning to do. And while, I mean, apparently this is a good scenario because we constantly report it works. The question is, is it always the best solution? Because if we know something about what we are trying to do, it does make sense to pre-process, to do feature engineering, to do whatever, to make the attack more powerful. I mean, just think of it. Why would I make life for my neural network more difficult? If I know something, I can use that knowledge to then plug in into something and make the attack more powerful. So the question is how to select relevant features. And of course, since with many techniques we needed to select features, there are many techniques how to do that. So I don't know, Pearson correlation, uh, SOST, SOSD, uh, chi-square, uh, outer encoders, more recently deep learning approach. Uh, so there is quite a lot of options. But there is also one more recent option that is based on the concept of similarity learning and what we call uh, what is called triplet networks and then triplet loss and so on so on. The concept is kind of simple. Yes, you can see the pointer. Okay, bar barely, but hopefully you can see. So what do we want to do? So here is the example AI. So that's called anchor, then PI, P like positive example, and n i plus one or whatever n is negative example. So the point is what we could do is we could try to make a system that 
minimizes the distances intra-class. So whatever belongs, let's say, to a leakage will somehow come closer to boost the effect of leakage. Whatever does not come, uh, is not part of the leakage will simply move away. So inter-class distance will somehow increase. And by doing that intuitively, you can think, okay, if relevant things are grouped together while irrelevant thing is discarded away, if you plug in the relevant things, it does make sense the attack could be more powerful. So this is the whole concept how triplet networks can work. And like I said, there are three types of, let's call them labels, positive, anchor, and negative. Positive and anchor have the same label, while negative can be any label that is not correct. And that's why we call it triplet network. There are three deep learning networks. Each of them makes its own embedding. You fit all that into a triplet loss function. And what you in the end obtain is somehow embedded. We could call it also latent space, which is compressed, but contains the most relevant information about the leakage. Uh, one could ask, okay, but what is it that are those final embedding space? What are those leakages? Because we could do that with other techniques. It is no linear combination of leakages. So your triplet loss will build something that is non-linear, which is a difference from many simpler techniques like PCA that will build a linear combination of features. And one could also say, well, autoencoders will build something that is non-linear, true, but autoencoders are non-supervised, while here we are in the supervised model. So we also use the information of labels. So in a way you can think, to try to use all the information you have. So we are building nonlinear representation where you also label gives you extra information. So yeah, uh, the example with two apples and, and one uh, a, a negative of banana is example of positive anchor negative setup. And now some, someone can ask, okay, but how do you do the learning? What does it actually mean? So basically you define your anchor and you define the distance up to the positive example. And then what is in that margin, in that uh, Euclidean distance space, you can say, well, it belongs to intraclass. What is outside of it, it's interclass difference. So here you can see a very easy example, and this is called easy positive, easy negative. Why? Well, because the, di the distance from anchor to positive is very small, the distance to negative is relatively large. And then for neural network, it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, this is the same, this is different. You can also have a different example where negative example is as close or even closer than positive example. And this is called hard negatives or hard triplets. And this, when you have, is making your algorithm uh, struggle a lot to, to converge to learn because the distance to negative example to what you want to avoid can be smaller than, than the distance to the positive example what you want to take. So there is something in the between and this is called semi-hard which is basically telling you that there is the distance till, the, till this kind of example is larger than to the easy example but it's smaller than to neg to negative examples that are easy. And here you govern how far do you do this differentiation by adding a parameter called margin. So the bigger the margin, the bigger is your centroid, the bigger is centroid, it, your approach becomes easier to, to do classification, but it's also more difficult to recognize the differences between examples. Of course, uh, you could make something more because side, side channel will offer you a bit more information that we maybe don't have in some other domains Well, triplet networks are commonly used like uh, NLP, so natural language processing. Why? Because think of the example, you wanna say what name is more distant from some other name, Alice, Bob, Eve. It's very hard to say if Alice's name is closer to Bob or it's closer to Eve. Objectively, of course, we can say whatever we want, what's closer, what's further. But in side channel, we have the 
the nice side that when we talk about labels, depending on the leakage model, some things are closer than some other things. Just consider the Hemming weight leakage model. And there the, the consumption is proportional to the Hemming weight. So one would say, well, to Hemming weight one, Hemming weight two is closer than Hemming weight seven. So you, you, we can use that extra information about the labels to build what we actually called hybrid distance. And this is represented here with, uh, with, uh, with this formula. Okay, so how does the whole attack work? Well, you have your measurements, your leakage traces, you put them in triplet network, you obtain different embeddings. From those embeddings, you plug those embeddings as input to your attack. So in a way, it's very simple and attack in general can be whatever you want. And this is, let's say, pre-processing phase. So uh, the experiment wise we did on yeah, different neural networks, different data sets. So common suspects, ASCAD fixed key, ASCAD variable key, AESHD data set, Hemingway, Heming distance, ID leakage models. For neural networks, we did quite a lot of experiments. Very small neural networks work fine, which is always nice, easy to tune. You also don't need to tune them a lot. And for the attack itself, we used template attack, okay? So we wanted to say if, if we do nice pre-processing, and then if you plug in template attack, can that compare with state-of-the-art deep learning attacks, direct ones? So result-wise, here you can see a bunch of numbers for different data sets. Uh, yeah, uh, mostly we were quite happy with the results because for, for most of the scenarios, you can see that template attack actually managed to get good performance. Of course, there are cases where other works, actually don't know which one is this, worked better. But all in all, the numbers looked very nice. So template did manage to, to use the information from embedded space to, to break the targets more efficiently than, I don't know, methodology paper or so on, so on. And one could also ask, yes, but what happens when you add more noise, desynchronization to data set, whatever. So we, we tested also a bit with that. Here, the comparison was a bit more difficult because of course, not every prior work had all the setups that we wanted to consider. But what we did see is that the same triplet network used before for embedding still works very nicely for new attack when you also add some kind of desynchronization or, or something. And of course, um, one could ask, why did you use the loss function that we used? And because there are many loss functions and these are not the classical loss functions like categorical cross entropy or whatever we know from before. There are specific loss functions just for similarity learning. So those are also a bunch of those. We also tested most common examples like contrastive loss, lifted structure, uh, pinball, hard, semi-hard, and so on, so on. But the one, the hybrid one, actually worked very nicely because it included information about the labels. And there are many hyperparameters, extra ones to consider. So if you remember our loss function from here, we needed to add new parameter alpha. So what happens when you add alpha? How, how difficult is to, to tweak that hyperparameter? And how, how important is the embedding size? How important, how long do you need to train? How big training set needs to be? And so on, so on. So classical questions. So some kind of, of study on the influence of parameters, hyperparameters. The most important message, so there are different graphs showing here. So loss function, you can, um, so alpha hyperparameter, you can see small values are rather stable. Embedding size, this is, in my opinion, the most interesting one. You can see that the small embedding size work very nicely. And why is this interesting? Well, if you have small embedding size, that means your covariance matrices with template will also not have strong requirements, which will allow you in many, many situations to build your template attack. So you will not get singular, singular matrix and so on, so on. Triplet margin, so how big is the difference between uh, positive, negative, again, 
we found this to be quite reasonably easy to tweak. So whatever we tried, unless we tried very stupid values, worked good. And also very interesting thing to, to train something like this, you need very little time. So a couple of epochs is enough to train uh, your model to do embedding extraction. And training set size, again, reasonable uh, training set sizes work stable. So unless you really feed extremely small set that is not enough to generalize, you will get good results. If you feed a big data set, of course it works nice, but it takes more time and so on, so on. And to conclude is, well, it seems cool because indeed we can, we found that you can make embedding that works for template attack, which was not clear at the beginning. Can you really combine features in such a nonlinear way that they will still make sense for, for template attack to use? And in a way with minimal computation efforts, we, we were quite lucky to see that we do match state-of-the-art deep learning attacks. So really attack that attacks on the raw features, which is also telling us that these nonlinear embeddings do contain a lot more information than just judging by the, by the size of embedding. Because for instance, size of embedding was 30, 40, 50. So very small when you compare with, uh, with raw features of 1,000 or 700 for us got fixed and so on, so on. Uh, yeah, the, the evaluation of critical hyperparameters showed stability, which is always nice because even if you have good solution, but becomes very difficult to tweak, very difficult to reproduce the results, then it's always problematic. So we found at least on the data sets we tested to be very easy to, to tune the hyperparameters. That being said, yeah, paper is everywhere. Uh, available on chess page. There is on our uh, Git, you can find the code. Uh, who was at the tutorial Sunday? I also gave the code for this. I believe uh, some people tried it already. They told me it works, even works. So that's nice. Uh, and that being said, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer. We have a question there. I will give you my microphone. Hello. Hi. Thanks uh, for the talk. Uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to ask if you can comment a bit more on the difference between LDA and your method for selecting features, because LDA is also uh, minimizing the intra-class difference and maximizing the inter-class difference. Yes. So that's precisely what your algorithm is doing, as far as I understood. Yes, but it's yeah, it's in the way how to to do it. So with uh, with LDA, I mean L in in LDA means linear. So you do it in a linear fashion. Here, you do it in nonlinear fashion, and we assume anything that can be approximated with with a neural network function, and then from the universal approximation theorem, we say well, we could approximate in theory whatever we want. So you can build extremely complicated function that maps your original features into embedded space. And even more than that, you use the information about the label because one could say autoencoder also does the nonlinear part. But once you add the information about the label, you can actually really tweak the differences. Like I said, Hemingway 2 and Hemingway 3 are potentially more similar than Hemingway 0 and Hemingway 8, at least from the, from the Hemingway leakage model from the consumption proportional leakage. So once you, the more information you add, potentially the better attack you can have. And since it's profiling attack, and we always say, well, in profiling phase, we know whatever we want to know. There is no reason why not to use that kind of information. So LDA is always a good choice. It's much simpler to do than, than this thing, but the way how you embed the space, it's very much different. So what sort of extra information you can add, for example, to your method than to LDA? This is the part that is not very clear to me. Oh, but I mean, uh, LDA will build you a linear combination of features. Yeah. So I don't know, feature one plus feature two or whatever. Here, 
It can be whatever you want. So uh, the nonlinear combination of features, for instance, in a way can also com be a combination of a mask already with, with the intermediate value. So already the, the embedding can have the masked part. I'm not saying that, uh, that this, of course, happens, but you give the opportunity for neural network to allow that. So you can already have the data set unmasked and let's say aligned even before you start with the attack part. Okay, thank you. Maybe so, we have time for a short yeah. question and a short answer. Okay. I will try. Uh, then let's keep this question short. Um, you analyze the influence of different hyperparameter choices. Sure. Yes. How did you optimize the hyperparameters? Was this done manually or did you use some optimizer? Uh, here we did it manually. So, because some of these hyperparameters for more side channel side, you know, like training set size, this is something that one commonly plays manually. And from the deep learning side, you had the parameter, hyperparameter alpha, which we said, well, let's just do a, a grid search, you know, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. And then when we are somewhere interesting, then let's try values between 0, 1 and 0, 2 and things like that. And embedding size, we also, uh, well, embedding size was actually quite easy because for instance, ask at fixed key has 700 features. It does not, in the, in the interval, it does not make sense to say, well, I have my small latent space that is 699 features. Then I can just plug in the original one. So we said it makes sense to start for smaller and then see how it progresses. So we started with extremely small embedding space. And at the moment when the results started to go worse, we said, we will stop here. Of course, it does not mean that going for some strange number somewhere else would not work, but we also wanna help our template attack to, to be as efficient as possible. And for that, having less features is good. Otherwise we can have problems with, with covariance. Yeah. Thank did you, you try going back to a uh, embedding of wait, size one? Did, did I try what? <laughs> embedding size one, did you try that one? Yes. Yes, we tried that. I don't think it's in the paper because that did not work well, as, as far as I remember. But this would be definitely for offline because I would need to check. So let's thank Stepan again. And um... Hello, our next uh, speaker is online. Yes, I'm in principle online. Hey, uh, do you want to give the presentation through Zoom or should we just play the video? I think uh, just play the video. It's a bit safer in terms of connection quality. Okay. So the topic of my talk today is breaking masked implementations of Clyde by means of side channel analysis. And this is joint work with Friederike Laus and Werner Schindler. Um, to give you a short outline of my talk, um, I will first give a brief introduction to side channel analysis. Then I will talk about the chess challenge 2020, which was a power analysis task. I will uh, describe a blueprint of a solution um, that outlines the, 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 the main steps that we take to, to solve uh, the chess challenge 2020 software challenges. I uh, will discuss some minor and some major problems that we had to overcome. And uh, the most significant problem that we had to overcome was a convergence problem with the deep learning model that we used to break this uh, chess challenge 2020. And um, this, uh, we, we invented a trick called the scattershot encoding that um, helps us s resolve this convergence problem. And in the end, I will further analyze this by um, using the scattershot encoding on a, a synthetic problem. And we will uh, supply a um, comparison to this to of our results to results obtained using the stochastic approach when used on the same task of the chess challenge 2020. So 
Mathematical cryptanalysis tends to be difficult for unweakened uh, versions of modern ciphers, so uh, it's much easier to break the implementation. One way to do this is by side channel attacks. This means using physical side effects of computation to gain additional information. And, and uh, about the secret that is being processed by an implementation. And uh, side channel attacks are a very practical threat when the adversary can do the required measurements. And uh, physical side effects of computation might be things like power usage or electromagnetic emanations or acoustic emanations. Can we do anything about it? Yes, we can do things about it. Um, we can uh, try to, in, in various ways, we can try to make it impossible for the adversary to try to um, either um, perform the measurements uh, on the physical side effects of computation that they want to exploit or to exploit uh, the, um, to, to get useful measurements. And one of the ways we can prevent the adversary from um, getting uh, the, from, from retrieving information about our secrets from the measurements that they can make is to employ masking. Uh, and um, masking has a fairly good theoretical justification, but tends to also be relatively expensive. Therefore, there is interest in uh, creating masking friendly ciphers and the Clyde cipher which was, which was the object of the CHESS 2020 challenge is one of those masking friendly ciphers. So to give you a basic idea about masking, um, usually a side channel adversary will have to use uh, multiple traces, multiple measurements in order to extract um, enough information about the secret that they want to extract um, to gain a significant advantage. Um, and um, the idea here is that the secret that is being processed by a cryptographic implementation remains constant across, um, across executions. And the only thing that changes is the data that is the, the other data that is being processed by the implementation and the noise that the implementation generates. And therefore, the secret might generate a, a, cons, a consistent signal that the adversary can try to exploit to uh, extract that, signal, that secret. And the basic idea of masking is to um, structure the implementation in such a way that this assumption that the secret remains un, uh, remains constant across implementations uh, across um, executions is wrong. So we break up the secret key and the data into shares in a secret sharing scheme. One runs the execution uh, of the um, primitives that one is trying to um, run um, on these shares instead of on the original data. So one has to rewrite the, um, the um, for instance, the encryption operation. If it is, if, if the primitives that we are trying to protect in, encrypts something and uh, we refresh the shares across executions or even within one execution of the scheme. And um, in this way, um, we prevent the adversary from seeing the same um, the same sensitive values when they observe different executions of our primitive. So in the chess challenge 2020, we had to break masked implementations of the masking friendly Clyde cipher by power analysis. Clyde is a tweakable lightweight block cipher with 128 bit block key and tweak size. There were seven different targets, four software and three hardware targets. All of them were masked implementations. The software targets had three, four, six and eight fold masking. Only the software targets were solved and the power traces for the software targets were captured at fairly high resolution um, at, on the order of several tens of thousands of data points per trace. The power traces uh, included roughly the first round of the cipher, but excluded the randomness generation and hence we had to treat the randomness used for share generation and refreshment as completely unpredictable. Um, breaking a challenge meant achieving a mean key rank smaller than 2 to the 32 using a number of traces chosen by the uh, team that was claiming a break. The goal of the contest was to break as many challenges as possible with as few traces as possible. And um, it turns out that our team was the only group to submit a solution to any of the challenges within the contest. Um, the 
the organizers of the contest provided 200,000 power traces together with the secret key, secret key shares, tweak values and plain text values for each challenge uh, for training solutions. Um, in addition, they provided a Python implementation of the masked Clyde logic. Um, they also provided um, test data that, uh, with fixed keys um, so that uh, so that um, and so that uh, competitors could test their solutions against up to 100,000 traces with a fixed key for each target and entries were evaluated against a data set kept secret by the organizers uh, key ranking was done by standard histogram based methods so Clyde acts on uh, blocks of 128 bits, which are arranged as uh, four times 32 bit arrays. It runs six rounds of encryption, each round being composed of a three key addition, an S box layer, an L box layer, and the addition of a constant. Another three key addition happens in the, uh, at the end of the cipher. The three key schedule is fairly simple and on the whole, the cipher is implementable with a fairly small number of gates, which, um, uh, which uh, contributes to its uh, being masking friendly. So our solution uses deep neural networks and all of our uh, code and data can be downloaded from GitHub. So we wanted to achieve the following. We wanted to, first of all, uh, if possible, win the contest by having the most efficient attacks. We wanted to use uh, fairly uh, highly auto automated attacks. So we uh, tried to avoid too much manual tuning with regards to hyperparameters, point of interest selection or leakage target selection. And we wanted to break all the software challenges using the same methods. And um, basically what we do is we get predictions for the shared cipher state, for all of the bits of the shared uh, cipher state uh, at some particular point of execution. Then we derive a guess for the unshared state, um, which of course comes with uh, an increase in uncertainty of our predictions as we have to predict, uh, as we have to combine um, predictions for different shares to uh, get a prediction for the unshared state. The unshared state then only depends on the Clyde logic and the inputs and not on the masking anymore, which means that for each uh, key hypothesis, we can um, calculate the unshared cipher state given all the inputs to Clyde and compare, compare the results of that calculation to the results of the side channel extraction. And that allows us to um, output a ranking of the keys. And um, in the end, it allows us to um, output a ranking of the keys where the target key is uh, among the first two to the 32 um, keys in, in this uh, ranking as desired. So how did we pick the leakage target? We just uh, t uh, target the state after the first S box. Then uh, how do we avoid a large search cost when rank ranking key hypotheses? Well, given the leakage target, we can rank key hypotheses one nibble at a time. So we have only 16 hypotheses per nibble. And uh, how do we process large traces without manual point of interest selections? We reuse a neural network structure introduced at SEC 2020 by Gore, Jakob and Schindler, uh, which was designed to handle large traces directly and the main ideas uh, behind the networks uh, are to deal with large trace sizes by subsampling the traces with varying offsets and then combining the predictions made for the, the subsampled uh, subtraces. And um, yeah, we just reuse that network structure. When we tried to implement this, however, um, we saw that our networks uh, converged well for many bits of the shared state, but failed completely for others. And of course, if we failed completely for to converge for um, one uh, for for some bit of the shared state, we will not see the um, we will not see one the, the corresponding bit of the unshared state. And if that happens, then since we don't see any bias for that bit, more data is not going to help us resolve the problem. So we had to we had to solve this convergence problem in order to um, in order to get predictions that uh, get us to the desired key rank. So the problem 
that we saw was that when predicting the internal cipher state naively, so one bit at a time, then all predicted bits are close to independent of each other, which means that we can make progress on learning to predict some bits while not learning how to predict the others. And in order to solve this, we invented a trick that we called the scattershot encoding, which is an alternative encoding of the data that we want to predict. Namely, we pick random subsets um, of the target bits and predict instead of the target bits themselves, Themselves, the Hamming weights of these random subsets of target bits. And if we have noisy predictions of these Hamming weights, then we can obtain noisy predictions of all the target bits by some linear algebra post-processing that we do. And uh, all of these sub-problems that we, that we construct, all of these uh, predictions of these uh, Hamming weights are strongly re related to each other because these, uh, these um, subsets of the target bits are not disjoint with each other, so they, sh they share a lot of bit, bit positions. And uh, therefore, one would hope that convergence across these subtasks should be more uniform than Uh, than it is in the case when we uh, naively try to predict the target bits themselves. And this is indeed true. So here we see the performance of our uh, solutions to the eight share challenge, which is the hardest one of the software challenges. And we see that with about 35,000 traces, we get, um, we, we, we get below a median key rank below that, uh, below the target of two to the 32. So, Our uh, solution works quite efficiently for the three share challenge and um, but we see that the, that the number of, of traces that we need to get to be below that key rank, uh, it, it does rise fairly, fairly quickly, but we manage to uh, solve all of the software challenges. Um, after the challenge was closed, another solution was published by Branchen and Standair and that solution is based on deep belief networks and their solution is more efficient than ours for the six and eight share challenges but comparable for the four share challenge and less efficient for the three share, three share challenge. So to analyze our technique further, we, uh, we looked at the scattershot encoding in more detail because the scattershot encoding is a slightly counterintuitive trick because it basically just multiplies the values we would like to predict by a fixed random binary matrix before running training and one, one does wonder why this helps. And to answer this or to get more insight into this, we designed a simple synthetic problem, namely learning to predict um, a particular F2 linear function that, is, uh, that has a very simple structure. It basically just outputs Uh, an F2 linear combination of its input bits, so there is no noise, no randomness, and the function to predict is quite simple. But uh, it has um, this function uh, has components that um, are a bitwise addition of many of the input bits, and those components are quite difficult to learn for a neural network. And um, looking at the um, performance of neural networks uh, that we tried at uh, learning to predict this function. We see that the naive approach and the scattershot approach show qualitatively similar behavior on this simple synthetic problem as on our side channel challenge. And so to uh, illustrate this, here is the learning history for the, um, for the on, on this synthetic problem for the naive uh, prediction of uh, all of the bits by a neural network. So we see that the neural network repeatedly gets stuck and in the end it fails uh, on, the, on, on a few of the hardest bits. It, it fails to see any bias. Whereas with the scattershot encoding, we get a fairly smooth learning history and also we, um, we do obtain uh, some degree of convergence even for the hardest bits. So we see at least some bias even for the hardest bits here. We also uh, compared our uh, results with results that one can obtain by applying the stochastic approach to the, uh, to the, to the uh, chess challenge 2020, which required adapting the stochastic approach to dealing with secret shared keys. Um, accounting for the high number of masking bits becomes quickly intractable even for the three shared challenge. Both the scattershot encoding and the stochastic approach see large biases in the same S-boxes, however. So we see um, 
we, we see a simi leakage uh, of a similar nature with both approaches. And uh, we found that our neural networks draw in information from some parts of the recorded traces that are surprising and therefore missed by the manual point of interest analysis done for the stochastic approach. And overall, the neural network based solution significantly outperforms the stochastic approach here. The deep learning approach uh, finds more unanticipated features and therefore yields better, better results on this uh, problem. However, the features exploited by the stochastic approach are human comprehensible by design, which is an advantage. So in conclusion, um, we can break uh, implementations with a significant degree of protection using neural networks without a need for deep analysis of the implementation by an analyst. However, masking works in principle because we see that the, um, that the number of traces required for a successful attack rises quickly with masking order and study of simple synthetic problems can be quite insightful for deep learning based side channel analysis as we have seen with our synthetic task. And I think um, for future work, it would be quite desirable to gain a deeper understanding of the scattershot encoding and, um, whether, and to see whether there are other similar tricks. And since the scattershot encoding could also be seen as an advanced loss function, it would be interesting to see whether one can learn advanced loss functions for side channel analysis. And um, this concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think Aaron is also online. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, uh, hi. Do you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Uh, hi. Uh, it's uh, Olivier Bronchat, so that you know who is speaking. Uh, so thank you very much for the, the talk and for the paper and for con contributing to the, the chess CTF. Um, I think one key ingredient of your attack is knowing the values of the shares when running the attack, which is usually not done um, by the, the rest, I mean, a, mo a large majority of the rest of the community, especially in the deep learning um, area. So could you like comment on that? And do you think that you could have um, succeeded with such an um, impressive success without knowing the randomness used? I, I think I think knowing the randomness used uh, was essential for for what we did. Yes, I mean we we um, we used the um, the, the supplied uh, Clyde logic, um, the the mask Clyde logic, and the and the, um, the the known values of the uh, randomness to derive those internal uh, to derive those. Um, internal share values uh, during training and um, without modification of the of the methods uh, I don't think that we would have been able to get a model that performs that well uh, just if, if we had just known if we had just known the the um, unshared keys and the um, and and the algorithm itself then I don't think with with the most methods that we used that we could have uh, obtained that result yeah and i'm feeling like as the bsi you are in a position like saying is it relevant or not to know the randomness when you analyze a cipher so uh, personally i think i think um it makes sense to um to look at um a st an, an attack an adversary model that is uh, that is strong enough to well that is um Personally, I think it makes sense to look at powerful adversary models um, because, um, I mean, the the algorithm is supposed is certainly supposed to be known by 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 any by by the adversary by Kirchhoff's principle, and um, I think in terms of in terms of evaluating um, the worst case that one can, I mean, the, the, the worst case that one has to deal with when ensuring that a particular implementation is secure, it does make sense, in my opinion, to uh, look in at, at an adversary who can be assumed to have weakened the implementation in such a way that he can, that for training purposes, he can see the randomness. Um, 
but I, I think it, it also makes it, it also makes perfect sense to look at weaker adversary models and, and to, to see um, how much one loses um, if, one, um, if, one, if one moves to a weaker adversary model. We have one more question. It's going to be short and if possible, the answer also short. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, sorry. So you mentioned, uh, hi, this is Marius. Uh, you mentioned the use of stochastic models uh, with a manual selection of points of interest, but there is also a method that we've shown on how to combine stochastic uh, models with LDA and PCA. Did you try that? So automatic selection via projection of LDA and PCA with stochastic models. Um, we, uh, we, we, we did... Um, we did a we did a we did a more or less a semi automatic um, approach to the to the point of interest selection, um, but I'm I'm not quite sure. I, I would have to talk to I would have to talk to my collaborators what exactly we did, um, what what exactly um, which approaches we exactly used to do the point of interest selection for the stochastic approach, as I mostly dealt with the neural network side of things. Thank you very much for this answer, and let's thank uh, the speaker. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Rei Uno, um, who came all the way from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you have the floor. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Rei Uno from Tohoku University, Japan. Uh, today, uh, I'm talking about a single story side channel attack on RFCRT. Uh, this is a collaborative work with, Kotar with Kotaro, Akira, and Naofumi. A uh, unified you know, attack uh, SCA on RSA has been studied for a long, long, long time. So traditionally, um, a attack uh, tried to distinguish squaring and multiplication during the modular exponentiation because the uh, secret exponent is uh, uh, directly represents the secret key of the RSA signing or decryption. Okay. <clears throat> in addition, uh, uh, in, uh, in particular, so many studies uh, uh, have been devoted to accurately estimate uh, the squaring or multiplication sequence uh, from only single trace uh, because single trace uh, is very important uh, be, uh, because uh, uh, public key cryptography is not necessarily performed as frequent as symmetric primitives. In addition, a partial key exposure attack on RSA-CRT has been also studied for a long time. So this attack uh, estimates the secret key, a uh, full secret key from partial information of the secret key, like this uh, figure. Uh, uh, this so attack uh, estimates the correct secret key by discarding the wrong secret key, contradicting the side channel leakage uh, obtained like this, uh, and uh, by uh, such a binary three manner. Uh, this uh, uh, partial key attack is uh, actually useful for making uh, uh, side channel attack practical uh, because uh, uh, side channel leakage from the uh, side channel leakage obtained by the attacker is not always correct or uh, correct. <clears throat> and actually, this talk is about deep learning based on side channel attacks. Uh, let me omit to introduce DLSGA because previous talks nicely introduced the DLSGA. And uh, what uh, I'd like to say here is uh, DL is a very strong tool for also for the SGS. But we, we, uh, we should still consider what to run by DL for efficient key recovery. Uh, for, uh, in my opinion, uh, for symmetric key cryptography, it will be a very established because uh, many existing DLSGA focuses on the conditional probability distribution of the Xbox output uh, given such a trace. And its uh, uh, optimality is well uh, uh, is analyzed in some studies. On the other hand, for public key cryptography, so uh, it should be more investigated because uh, the what you learn uh, by DL is completely dependent on the algorithm itself. So today uh, we talk about uh, the 
そう、エシチェント、あ、ニュー、ディープラーニングベースのサイトのアタック、オン、アルテシエアルティ。そう、ウィスリーアートと、そう、ハウティ、エス、ハウティエスティメイト、ザピクレットスポイント、フロムサイチャルトレイズ。アンド、ニューパーシャルキー、エクスポージャーアタック、テーラーメイドフォーアワーアタック。Uh, in, fact, in fact, our attack can be applied to state of the art RFCRT implementations.、Uh, this means、uh, the implementation with window exponentiation with dummy load as hiding kind of measures.、Uh, such an implementation is、uh, frequently, frequently used in the many open source libraries. So, while existing DLCS on RSF or discrete logarithm targets binary exponentiation. The proposal d a c is、uh, evaluated using、uh, actual implementation using the GMP.、Uh, this is the major multiple decision library, and、uh, this is、uh, frequently used in the cryptographic operation. And we also confirm the applicability of the proposal d a c to some related cryptographic libraries,、uh, uh, including OpenSSR, Botan, and RibGcrypt. Okay, let me start from、uh, RSA crypto systems. So I,、uh, so I know、uh, cryptographers have、uh, seen this、uh, RSA formula so,、uh, very, very, very frequently. And for chess audience, so you are interested in how to implement these formulas securely and efficiently. So let's focus on open source RSA implementation because such an implementation、uh, has a very high performance and very practical. Because、uh, this is、uh, implemented by e x p e r t of the cryptographic implementation. You know,、uh, Shining r e a l i z e r Theory, CRT, is、uh, usually used for the RSA decryption or signing、uh, because、uh, it can reduce computational cost by a factor of two to four、uh, without almost no overhead.、Uh, in addition,、uh, in implementing RSA, the exponentiation algorithm.、Uh, Uh, is very important and which mainly determines the security and efficiency. So, this table、uh, summarizes the、uh, uh, exponentiation, major exponentiation algorithms for implementing RSA. And this is classified to two types of the binary exponentiation and the windowed exponentiation. So, actually, many open source、uh, libraries use、uh, uh, windowed exponentiation、uh, thanks to its high performance. And some levels of resistance to the side channel at a simple power analysis. So,、uh, I introduce a fixed window exponentiation. So, this is the fastest constant time exponentiation to the best of my knowledge. So, let W denote the window size as a parameter. So, fixed window exponentiation consists of the、uh, two stages of pre computation and main loop. In pre computation, we make pre computation table which contains、uh, two to the power of W elements. And in the ISA address of the table,、uh, it uh, stores uh, uh, C to the power of I, where、uh, C is the base. And in follow, following the main loop,、uh, <clears throat> uh, we perform scaling double times and then perform multiplication with pre computation table value、uh, according to the te temporal window value. And we repeat this procedure. So, this、uh, figure shows the example of the fixed window exponentiation with 12 bit exponent and w equal 4.、Uh, because the、uh, uh, exponent is 12 bit, so we have a 3, 4 bit temporal window value because w equal 4. And、uh, after the pre computation, we perform scaling, 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 and then perform multiplication with the pre computation table value. Here, the temporal window value is、uh, 1101. We perform the multiplication with c to the power of 1101, so it's 13. So we repeat this procedure until the end of the、uh, exponent bit. So, how about the security of a、uh, side shell security of this exponentiation? So, in fact,、uh, this is secure against、uh, simple power analysis because、uh, scaling multiplication sequence is independent of the secret exponent. However, there is another possibility of,、uh, of the leakage on the temporal window value.、Uh, in fact, the attacker can recover the temporal window value. The attacker immediately h a v e the secret key because the temporal window value directly represents the secret exponent.、Uh, such a leakage can be acquired by, for example, a prime and probe, address bit DPA, or collision analysis. So,、uh, because、uh, the multiplication operand is loaded from the temporal window, uh, sorry, uh, loaded from a pre computation table, so we should consider leakage and security of the operand loading. 
In fact, uh, many open source libraries employ dummy load as a countermeasure to hide the temporal window value. So this figure shows the operand loading uh, used on GMP. Uh, the main idea of this implementation is uh, uh, all operands in pre-computation table are accessed in every multiplication, even if it is not actually used for the multiplication. And this algorithm shows the mask value to uh, determine the true, uh, true load. And this right figure shows an equivalent represent circuit representation of this algorithm. So this algorithm, uh, this circuit operates with the two to the power of W iterations. So if the i iteration is the true load, this intermediate register S uh, stores the pre-composition table value loaded from i address. So otherwise, if the, for the uh, dummy load iterations, uh, this uh, register holds the previous value and uh, the loaded value is discarded. Such a combination of window exponentiation and uh, dummy load uh, are believed to be sufficient to uh, protect against uh, uh, remote timing attack or remote cache attacks. But uh, we are talking about uh, uh, power or EM cycle attacks on such an uh, implementation today. So in fact, uh, it, uh, library developers do not uh, always consider such a uh, physical size tiles, uh, but uh, such an uh, open implementation can be a first choice if you would like to implement RSA on embedded devices. Uh, due to the, its uh, high performance, maturity, or uh, high presence. So this figure shows the overview of the proposed attack. So this uh, attack flow uh, consists of the secret key exposition and uh, partial key exposure attack. So this is not very novel. <coughs> so uh, very similar to the profiled attack on RSA. <coughs> However, our novelty includes the development of the new techniques for uh, these steps. Uh, this slide summarizes the proposed methodology. So the proposed attack focusing on the fact that the, our operand loading consists of the only one true load and uh, all the remaining load are dummy load. So this fact uh, leads to the two important points for the suggestion attacker. So the so first point is the value of the register S is changed only when the true load. So this uh, makes the difference uh, in the size of the traces between the true and the dummy load, which can be exploited by the attacker. Then <clears throat> the second point is more important. So order of true load and the dummy load are fully depends on the temporal window value. And actually true and dummy load sequence represents the temporal window value as a one hot code. So uh, this table shows the exa uh, example of the fixed window uh, exponentiation again. So if the temporal window value is 1101, so scaling and multiplication sequence is in independent of this value. But the true and dummy load sequence is fully dependent, dependent on this value. So namely, the, the temporal window value is 1101, so I mean the 13. So 13th uh, loading is the true load, and the remaining other load is the dummy load. So I'd like to say so this, distinguishing the true, true and dummy load is sufficient for recovering uh, uh, secret exponent and secret key. And uh, so, so let's consider uh, how, to ex uh, how to distinguish true and dummy load. So we use uh, DLS, DLSGA for this purpose. So we employ two classification neural network to distinguish true and dummy load. So uh, proposed attack is the profiled attack con uh, containing the training and attack phases. The in training phase, we train a neural network using uh, a training dataset, uh, which consists of the side channel traces for the true and dummy load. The in, and this figure shows the overview of the our attack phase. So in uh, training phase, we uh, train the neural, neural network to imitate uh, conditional probability distribution of true load uh, given side channel trace. So to uh, determine the true load, we perform uh, two to the power of W two classifications to distinguish the true and the mirror load uh, to, uh, in estimating one temporal window value. So namely, uh, we perform the NN inference for the first loading, of, uh, lo first loading, second, second loading, third loading, and uh, to, the, to the power of W uh, loading. And uh, we estimate load operation with highest probability as the true load. Uh, because it is most, most likely one. 
this is uh, simply done by the taking all max of the original outputs for these inferences. Uh, what is uh, important here is that energy inference is reduced to two classification from uh, to the power of W classification. So such a two classification is a far simpler task than such a two multi class classification. So this is the uh, uh, improvement of energy accuracy, the reduction of uh, learning cost, and finally, uh, it is an efficient attack. So we also propose a new partial key exposure attack, but uh, let me omit the detail uh, explanation of this, uh, the detail of this algorithm due to the time constraint. Uh, however, the proposal, key idea of the proposal attack is uh, we perform uh, the, this uh, partial key exposure attack uh, in a w bit, assuming that the W bitwise error, while the existing attack assumes the uh, error bits are uniformly distributed. So to correct W bitwise manner, uh, W bitwise error uh, efficiently, we utilize the heuristics and the priority deck uh, <clears throat> to uh, perform the, this uh, branch and prune strategy. Uh, please see our paper for detail. <clears throat> and uh, we uh, demonstrate uh, uh, experimental attacks on uh, uh, 10, 24-bit RFCRT implementation with uh, GMP. Uh, uh, here, uh, 10,024 bit RFA CRT implementation means uh, so we require 128 times two temporal window value estimation for uh, W equal four. So W equal four is uh, the, uh, determined by G GMP as the optimal parameter in this case. Uh, we used uh, almost uh, 60 million EM traces for the training. And this uh, figure, left figure shows uh, EM traces for true and dummy load. Uh, please note that it's uh, quite difficult, at least for me, uh, to distinguish uh, true and dummy load from these types of channel traces. And we use the uh, convolutional CNN, CNN for our experiment. And this table shows the, our uh, result. So we evaluated the test phase accuracy using 24 different secret keys. I mean, uh, we uh, performed the uh, uh, estimation of 48 exponents, uh, 48 times 128 bit uh, temporal window value estimation, and uh, 48 times 128 times 16 true and dummy load distinguish. So uh, we can achieve, very, uh, our neural network can achieve very high accuracy for true and dummy load distinguish and temporal window value of uh, more than the 99%. And uh, uh, the, our neural network also can achieve the uh, exponent recovery with the 80% accuracy. Because this means uh, the success rate of the, our attack is uh, almost 80%, even without partial key exposure attack. Uh, we also perform the template attack and to, to the power of W classification in a for a comparison. Uh, as a uh, template attack is a major existing method and uh, the multi class classification is a straightforward extension of the pro, uh, existing DLSGA. As a result, uh, we cannot achieve very high accuracy for uh, using them and uh, they are insufficient for the key recovery, even using uh, the partial key exposure attack. We also analyzed the frequency of number of estimation errors of the proposed DLSGA and confirmed uh, we, uh, the proposed attack uh, achieved not more than three errors during the exponentiation. And finally, we evaluate the success rate of the uh, overall success rate using the uh, partial key exposure attack. So we generated uh, 100 so random RFACRT secret keys with double bitwise errors to simulate errors included in our DLSGA. Uh, this figure shows the result. So horizontal axis is the number of errors and vertical axis is the uh, uh, computational cost. So we confirm the proposal attack can recover full key with 100% success rate within a few or a dozen of seconds. It's very uh, practically feasible. For a comparison, uh, we also performed the clinically told attack and it achieved uh, at most 80% success rate. So we confirmed the uh, feasibility and effectiveness of the proposed attack. So please note that so this result does not mean our attack is superior to the clinically told attack and actually means our attack is well calibrated to, to our DLSGA. 
Okay, it's closing. Uh, uh, let, let's close in my talk. Uh, we developed a new DLSCA on uh, applicable to the state of the art CRT RSA implementations. Uh, in our paper, uh, we uh, propose a countermeasure against the proposed attack. Uh, please see uh, our paper for detail. Uh, finally, uh, we'd like to say for the year can offer strong attacks uh, even on the black box implementations. But if the uh, in implementation detail is available, we can achieve more stronger attack. That's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> thank you for the talk. Uh, you said that the Eninger Shasham algorithm was not applicable. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Uh, pardon? Uh, you said that the Eninger Shasham algorithm was not applicable for the key reconstruction. Can you elaborate a bit on this or? Uh, sorry, uh, please uh, speak slowly uh, because the sound is not very clear. Sorry? Uh, please uh, speak slowly because the sound is not very clear. Uh, maybe you can take this offline after I'm not sure I understand what you said. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it uh, this, right uh, as well. You, you're mentioning the Henica attack? The first one, yeah, you said that the it's not applicable for you. I know, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, so uh, why uh, the Hedinga Shakama attack is applicable is the difference of the uh, leakage model. So, uh, so our attack in our attack, we can uh, estimate the secret key or uh, complete secret key without uh, any er erasure, but contains the uh, bit flips. So, uh, this is uh, this leakage model is not covered by Hedinga Shakama attack. Okay, thank you. I, I'm uh, under the impression that you didn't make it very clear how many traces you need per key. Uh, uh, so, sorry, pardon? How many traces you need per key? How many traces you need? Um, uh, how many traces? Uh, yes. Uh, traces. Uh, uh, we, uh, we use uh, uh, 62 million traces for training and uh, only one trace for the attack. So this is a single trace attack. Is the data set publicly available? Your data set, is it available? Uh, sorry? Your data set, is it available? Uh, yes, already published in our uh, GitHub repository. Uh, um, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. What was the target? Uh, what did you run it on the, uh, the experiments? Um, are we are target to the... Uh, 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 so, GNU uh, multiplication library, GMP uh, exponentiation. Uh, this yeah, is a yeah. major. Uh, so was it was it running on like bare metal? I assume. I, okay. Uh, yes. metal. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we will take it offline. Uh, they will take it offline. So let's thank uh, Ray for his very, very great talk. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Guillermo Perin. And in the meantime, I want to thank you uh, as the audience for uh, having a lot of questions and having interesting discussion. Makes my life as uh, the session chair very easy. So hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. So um, I will talk about uh, today some about a very specific uh, open problem in deep learning based sidechain analysis that is feature selection that we believe it's not really well covered in the recent research. So uh, the context of this work is profiling sidechain analysis. Like it was, uh, we saw many presentations before already describing the, this context. So I will skip this part. Um, so 
we had many assumptions for this work. And the first one is about the different, it's about assumptions on the attack itself. Like we have uh, white, on the extreme sides, we have white box profiling analysis. We have black box profiling attacks. And uh, although uh, what worst, uh, the worst case security evaluation is possible with uh, white box profiling attacks on the, uh, uh, on the black box side, this is not really uh, possible. And then this, uh, how you differentiate both types of evaluations is on the assumptions and the knowledge that the attacker is considered that the attacker uh, possessed. So for example, for the white box analysis, you have knowledge on the randomness, for example, the masks, and also the source code the, of the implementation, while in the black box scenario, you don't assume any previous knowledge about the target, basically what is public uh, available only. So white box profiling attacks are fast and efficient in order to uh, uh, describe the security of the implementation. And black box attacks are more difficult to implement and subject to many mistakes for many different reasons. And this is also related to the profiling model reliability. So as, as an example, you would do it, for example, you choose deep neural networks to do a profiling attack, but if you get bad results in the sense that you don't, or good results, depending on the perspective, if you don't break the target, then you need to understand if the target is really secure or if the profiling attack is wrong. So there is this gap between these two uh, scenarios. And one thing that we ask ourselves is uh, if we apply deep learning attacks, which provide in practice very good results, how the hyperparameter search effort actually covers uh, this gap can uh, not make, of course, white box and black box equal in performance, but reduces the gap between those two approaches. And obviously on the white box scenario, we have feature selection and on the black box scenario, we don't have feature selection ideally. So the second motivation is about the model size. So um, to define the neural network you want to uh, implement. So it's becoming more and more large, the options for, for describing to, to implement the attack. And when we go for, for example, small models, and usually this is, the, this is selected based on small data sets as well. So, uh, small models, uh, they have their own benefits. For example, they are implicitly regularized, so they are less prone to overfitting, but they are more efficient on small uh, data sets. And I would like to refer to this very nice work from Wouters from 2020, which just puts a very nice perspective on how, what is the capacity of small models against several data sets. So also small models together with optimization methods uh, deliver also very good results. So next year we saw papers, uh, or in the recent years, we saw papers using hyperparameter search together with the small neural networks, and they were uh, able to get even better results also on small data sets, not really large scale data sets. And finally, we saw uh, publications, for example, last year, uh, a paper appeared showing uh, showing very large uh, data sets, rope measurements on some uh, devices, and they uh, consider very long, very big neural networks for that. So the attacks were crazy efficient, very few uh, traces, like zero, uh, one to 10 traces for some data sets were enough to break the target on a, uh, uh, applying them on the road trace. So it's quite impressive to see, but the, the, the models are very, very large. So this also puts a question like, is it necessary to improve the model size if we improve this, the scale of the data set? So feature selection basically, uh, yeah, so we need to select the main points of interest in our attack. So if we, cons if we go for the more black box evaluations, but we also select small intervals, which is also done mostly in the recent works, uh, we don't see uh, that uh, uh, even a small neural network, we will struggle so much in finding the second order leakages and first order masked implementation, for example, because you're gonna have several uh, points of interest leak information and then to differentiate between what is noise, what is leakage doesn't become a very difficult task. And for people that practice on this topic, it, we see that it's not really difficult to find an efficient neural network against data, public available data sets. On the other hand, if we do, uh, if we apply, uh, if we take a much longer interval where the location of the points of interest related to our intermediate variable are more con are concentrated in very specific points of interest, then we see a situation when the neural network needs to uh, find these points of interest and discard the rest of the, uh, of the trace. So if the, the leakage is located in some specific points, then 
we start to question ourselves if small modules are enough or not for uh, for the task. And also, if we ideally here, or, or, uh, intuitively, we would go for more for larger data sets because this would uh, provide more capacity. But on the other hand, larger data sets, uh, neural networks, sorry, they are they, they are they can easily overfit depending on the size of the data set and in terms of number of measurements. And therefore you have another problem, a problem to solve. So one way to, to defeat the regular overfitting obviously is regularizing the model in a way that you reduce its capacity either by reducing its size or by applying some explicit regularization techniques like for example, dropout or uh, L1, L2 early stopping data augmentation. And uh, so what we wanted to do, the model to do using the regularization is to make it more insensitive to noise or all the relevant features contained in the trace and making more uh, uh, looking only to the relevant ones that appear in the, in the measurements. So in reality, feature selection either in academic or in industry, are done, they are done in different ways. So if we considered all the publications that we have recently uh, in the previous works, we see that feature selection is usually taken into account because we usually attack data sets that are already uh, optimized for in terms of interval of selection. So I can give an example of ASCAD data set that is massively used in our previous works and we attack a very specific interval which already is selected based on the knowledge of some of the randomness. Uh, but there is a reason for that. It's because we are more interested in the method itself of the attack and not really on this practicality of the attack. So we invest more time on the optimization algorithms, metrics, uh, loss functions, etc., rather than the, as the practical aspects. And for industry or real world targets, uh, I can say that this pre-processing part of feature selection will never be ignored because it's not smart to just to take a raw measurement and throw away into a ne neural network. So usually we're gonna do some pre-processing steps because it's, it's intuitive to do them. And pre-processing can be difficult sometimes. And so uh, you can trim as much as you can, you can optimize as much as you can, but there is a point where you cannot do it anymore. And then uh, this is why deep neural networks also became more popular in the domain because they are assuming to bypass uh, the problems of feature selection. And, but to what extent this is really true, we don't know exactly, but then we started to investigate in this work a bit more with more experiments. So for that, we define the three uh, the scenarios. The first one is similar to white box evaluations where we, we select points of interest based on leakage assessment and masks are known for that. So the second scenario is optimized points of interest, which, the, which we're gonna see it's similar to previous works. So we use, uh, yeah, so masks are known for the selection of the, the intervals of or the feature selection in the second case, but there is one data set that we use that we don't have access to the masks and still we were able to define the intervals for that data, that data set. And finally, the most interesting scenario, which is completely black, black box where we don't know uh, the masks and we attack all available features or intervals where the attack should be obvious, discarding some of the parts that are irrelevant. For example, we attack the first round of the S-box and then we simply discard the rest of the S-box uh, rounds. So feature selection, what we usually do uh, is when we have um, a, a different data sets to attack, we go for different hyperparameter tuning uh, strategies. And also de depending on feature selection, we also go for different hyperparameter tuning strategies. But in this paper, what we do is to see how the same hyperparameter tuning strategy, the same configuration, the same range can be applied among uh, for multiple scenarios. And multiple scenarios, I mean different data sets, leakage models, model types, uh, I mean convolutional ne neural networks, multi-layer perceptron, and the feature selection scenarios. And for each case, we, uh, we search it for up to 500 models, and except for the first scenario where we, uh, the, the, to find good models were not dif very difficult, so we searched for 128. And the total number of experiments in this paper is around 50,000 to cover uh, all the possible uh, scenarios that we wanted. And we implemented grid and random search, grid search for the white box case and random search for the other two scenarios. So, but even, uh, but to make it more uh, realistically, we define very large search space 
you know, in a way that what we cover with our search is really irrelevant amount compared to the other possibilities. And we uh, the, we keep kept using small neural networks where we allow them to go up to eight hidden layers only. And to the evaluation metrics to select the model from the random search, from the hyperparameter search, was guessing entropy. I mean, the number of attack traces uh, necessary to reach guessing entropy equal to zero or to one, depending how the scale we're going to use, and a perceived information for the uh, white box, the first scenario, which is white box. And we use the perceived information in the first case and because it's a new metric and also we saw that the results uh, on the that are that are computed with the equation there on the right are quite precise are quite uh, um, I would say it yeah accurate for what we are measuring compared to the guessing entropy and then for the perceived information we estimate the amount of traces required for a certain success rate so we did experiments on four data sets, ASCAD uh, version one uh, on fixed key and random keys and DPAV4.2 DPA, from DPA context data set and also CHESS CTF 2018. So the only data set that contains the same keys in the, first, in the attack and the profiling phase is the ASCAD with fixed key there, but the, all, all the rest of the data sets, they have different keys on both profiling and uh, validation or, or attack phases. So they are also first started masked software implementations, and we always so we always search for a model for uh, for one single key byte, and then we extend the same model on the rest of the key. So I will share some results uh, from all the scenarios we tried. So first for the refined points of interest, which is uh, in the white box case, and here we saw that. Uh, we tested it, uh, we applied the, on the all data sets. I will show for two of them. And we, we applied uh, Gaussian noise on the traces to see how uh, white box uh, and the hyperparameter search can actually work, how this resilience of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the implementation when it's more noisy against hyperparameter search. We saw, of course, that more noisy the data set becomes more traces we need. But what we saw is that if we keep increasing the number of points of interest, for the attack, then uh, the noise really doesn't care. It doesn't affect so much the performance of the attack. Uh, so um, on the white axis here, what you see is the, that metric derived from perceived information. And we use it this in this scenario because when perceived information is positive, then we saw that the, the amount of traces estimated using this metric is quite uh, aligned with the amount of traces estimated using guessing entropy. And so the purple line there is Gaussian template attacks. And we, uh, what we uh, saw interesting is that Gaussian template attacks sometimes is better than the uh, convolutional neural networks and multi-layer perception when we have a reduced amount of models. When we go for more and more models, we always find some model that has more uh, capacity in terms of number of required traces. And we always find uh, some results showing that the key is possible to be recovered with a single measurement. Here on the PAV4.2, which is a little bit more noisy data set, it contains less uh, points of interest to be selected that are very leaky. And we saw that, deep, uh, again, deep neural networks uh, were in, in general more efficient than Gaussian template attacks, but the amount of traces required are so small that we cannot say more efficient, but because both methods work quite well. So we also did uh, optimize points of interest mostly for a reference because this is a these are data sets largely considered in previous work and from the amount of uh, from the performance that we found with hyper, with our hyperparameter search process we see that we are uh, actually uh, aligned with the state of the art it's just to set some reference so uh, our hyperparameter search is not really biased to make better or worse results in some of the cases and so we could see for example with pre-selecting a a uh, specific interval for attack, we cannot reduce the key, uh, the, uh, we cannot reduce the amount of traces below, for example, 78 for CNNs on ASCAD random keys, but we were able to get with a single measurement on DPA before the two. So uh, indicating that deep neural networks, although uh, can actually uh, do quite well, even when the, the, the interval, the feature selection 
that we are doing includes more noisy samples. And for chest CTF, which is um, uh, we had much less measurement, I think 30,000 measurements for profiling, then uh, the performance the model was not good for all scenarios, but for Heming weight model, it works quite well. So now, uh, finally, for the last uh, scenario here and the non-optimized points of interest, which is more aligned with the black box evaluations. Uh, we, we, this was very surprising because this was the starting point of the paper. We started directly working on the, all this, uh, in, on the road traces. And then we saw that uh, for ASCAT uh, random keys specifically, we were able to get uh, the key in the, in the attack phase with a single measurement using a, a single uh, single hidden layer MLP containing 500 neurons. And this was, uh, so we, and when we compare to the previous work where uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that can implement a very large neural network containing up to 30 or 40 layers, then this, there is quite a big difference. So with a single hidden layer here, you can recover the key with a single measurement. So that was quite interesting. For ASCAD fit, fixed key also we got with a single measurement, but this data set is the same key on the both sides. So uh, might be interpreted differently if you go into more details. For, so with less leaky data sets with ASCAD is, the, the ASCAD is relatively more leaky than DPAV4 and Chess CTF. So for these two data sets here, uh, we saw also uh, very good results on Chess CTF. We could get the key with eight measurements on the raw data set. And um, yeah, so, but it worked better for, uh, for Hemingway to leakage model. So we attacked the first part of the implement. So this, this implementation has somehow um, 600,000 points, I think. So we attack only 150,000 points, which are the first part of the measurement. But without any, this can be considered as without feature selection because this is obvious and eight traces is already a very small amount. For DPAV4, the same random search strategy uh, we were able to get with 400 traces. It's relatively much more than the other data sets, but considering that we didn't change anything in the search strategy, this is quite an advantage. And then we apply this, the model found for one key byte to the rest of the, uh, of the key bytes. And we can see that we are, uh, at least for one scenario, uh, one combination of model type and leakage model, we were able to get the, the full key. And specifically for ASCA, the random keys, the third line on the table, you can see that we needed three measurements for the full key recovery on the, on the raw data sets. Um, yeah, so we also did analysis on desynchronization, uh, and then we didn't change any hyperparameter in the search uh, in the search space. We just applied the same random search, and we were and we did with and without data augmentation, applying random shifts during the training, and we saw also very good results for uh, for all data sets except for DPAV4.2, where we reduced the get the entropy of the key, but not. To, to want to consider as a successful attack. But for ASCAD random keys, for example, we could take with 25 traces. And obviously, so this is a summary of results and that show that with, with more relaxed feature selection scenario, more hyperparameter search you need, more effort you need on this side. Uh, when we have desynchronization for in some cases, only 1% or even less of the, uh, of the search space gave us a uh, successful result. And, but for white box, sometimes it's hundred percent of the mods that good uh, positive results. And yeah, so this uh, emphasized that the very extensive random search is some, somehow necessary to, to make very efficient attacks on, on black box way. So in conclusion yeah, so uh, we concluded more or less that yes, Deep learning can skip feature selection, which is uh, written in many places that it can skip. So somehow it can, as long as we do long hyperparameter search pros. So the effort on the hyperparameter search needs to be applied. And we apply the same search strategy on all the targets, all the, all the situations. And we would say that black, in black box scenario to, to estimate the strength of, of the attacker, uh, the learnability capacity is something to be taken into account.
And we emphasize also that small models and small CNN and NLP models uh, can defeat multiple targets, uh, first order mass implementations, even on very large intervals or raw data. But of course, uh, I think we should invest on more complex deep learning approach, also random uh, search approach, when we move to more difficult targets, for example, a target uh, ASCAD V2, which is publicly available and contains more protections. Okay, so thank you very much for attending this presentation. If you have any questions, I would like to have, I would be happy to answer. Questions? Thank you very much for a nice presentation. I have a question about the, the fixed um, fixed key data set. How did you make sure, did you choose, did you select the part of the trace that like, like yeah, I mean the bias due to the key. Mm -hmm. Did you try that method or? Selecting part of the trace you mean? Like, yeah, how, 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 how did you make sure that it's not biased? How I make sure that, for example, there is no first order leakage, for example, or that I don't learn only the key. I mean, okay, you are using identity model. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there is a there is a, an issue in that. So this is why I I included most results on the on the ASCAD random keys because I think there is this is something to be investigated. But I believe if you learn a data set that has a fixed key and then apply attack phase on a fixed key you know, on identity leakage model, you can only learn that situation. It doesn't generalize to different keys. So that could be a possibility. Any other questions? Then, uh, in view of time, maybe we should thank uh, Guillerme. Mm -hmm. We went over time. I, I, I went